Um, so welcome folks who are just entered into our, from our waiting room into the webinar. We're just gonna get started here in a few minutes. So while you wait, we have our whiteboard up again, in case you were able to join one of our previous webinars. We'd love for you to participate, get those participation muscles warmed up. Um, so for this whiteboard, we're asking folks to add to this table or to our sheet here, what's an unusual food pairing that you love, or maybe one, maybe one that you tried once and you never wanna try again. Um, so go ahead and participate. You'll see instructions on how to participate in the chat box here in a second. We'll have that pop up. So in case you're not sure how to do this, but you go to the top of your screen where you see uh, you're viewing Bianca's screen. There's a view options tab. And if you click that, you'll see annotate and that will allow you to contribute to our whiteboard. And we'll get started here in just a couple minutes. Oh, I see the chat beef time. I wonder what that gets paired with. <laughs> so welcome um, folks that are joining our webinar, maybe just got on. I see we have about um, 20 or so attendees who are entering. We're doing our, um, our start to our webinar, which is our whiteboard. Um, so you'll see here a question or um, it's a request to share an unusual food pairing that you love. Uh, or maybe you tried something once and really didn't like it, never want to try it again. Uh, so if you go to the top of your screen where you see that you're viewing Bianca's shared screen, there's a view options tab and you click that and there's an annotate option and you click annotate and allows you to draw or add a text box of an unusual food pairing that you like. So we'll get those participation muscles warmed up and we'll get started here in just a minute or two while more folks join. The eggs and jam. That's that is a that's an interesting pairing. I can't say I've tried that one before. Well, I'll give it I'll give it a shot. Maybe is there a particular type of jam you recommend? Please add it if so. I don't want to I don't want to try this with the wrong jam. More folks are coming in. Um, so welcome for those who have joined yet, and I, the chat box may be empty if you just joined. I'm not sure if you can see old instructions, but this is our whiteboard, um, and we do this at the start of every webinar before we get started to get your participation muscles warmed up. So we'd like to ask you to share an unusual food pairing that you love, or maybe one that you tried that you really didn't care for. Um, and how you do this is you go to the top of your screen where it says you're viewing Bianca's screen. There's a view options tab. Um, and when you click that, you can go down and scroll to annotate, and then that's going to allow you to paint uh, with your mouse and draw your response, or you can add a text box anywhere on this whiteboard and enter your response to this question of sharing an unusual food pairing that you love, or maybe one that you tried once and will never try again. Ah, strawberry jam. Thank you. Strawberry jam and eggs. Very unusual. Man, I need some like further descriptions for some of these. Zuag, I don't even know how to pronounce that. Zuag with mac and cheese, that sounds awesome. I don't have no idea what that is though. <laughs> Please feel free to add it in the chat if you wanna further explain. Um, welcome folks, we're getting more and more people in right now. Uh, so we'll give this just another minute, but please continue to add some unusual food pairings that you love, maybe ones that you tried once and you're never gonna try again. Um, so we'd love for you to participate on our whiteboard. You can do so by going to the shared screen function and going to view options, and then you click annotate, and that's gonna allow you to participate on our whiteboard that you see here. And always feel free to add things in the chat box as well, um, in case this proves to be difficult for you. 
Um, but we'd love for you to participate, get some more responses on here. Uh, so you go up to the top of your shared screen where you're seeing this whiteboard and you go to view options, you click annotate, and then it's going to pull up a tab where you can text or draw or use your mouse to, to add in your responses to this question. So we'd love for you to participate. Get some more responses on here. Chips and cream cheese. All right. I've never tried that one either. I see some, I see some heads nodding. It's happened before with other people. Kale and peanut butter. Awesome. <laughs> people want further description. Maybe it's a, an, it's like cooked kale with like a peanut sauce or something, or just kale with peanut butter. All raw. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you everyone um, for participating. I see some more folks are throwing on some responses. So we'll just give you a few more seconds here. Cucumbers and cream cheese. I see cotton candy and white zen. All right. <laughs> oh, thank you for, Leah. thank you for that description. Uh, Persian herbal seasoning with her mac and cheese. That's awesome. All right. Well, thank you everyone for participating in that. We're starting to get our participation muscles warmed up. So we're going to go ahead and start our slide presentation and begin with today's webinar. Um, so I, I love, I'm just so happy to have you all here on today's webinar. We're really excited. This is our third webinar of our four part series. Um, so we're going to get our slides up here. And first, I want to just have a fun recap of some of the past whiteboard participation because we've seen some good stuff. Um, so this is from our December 9th webinar. We asked people, if you can only eat one food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Um, and I saw a lot of tacos. So I just want to highlight how much people love tacos. I also like to highlight how tacos can also be climate friendly. We see potato tacos, lentil tacos, lots of taco options. Tacos are delicious. So thanks for, for sharing that. Um, and this was our other uh, whiteboard session from January 13th or we had a fun question, uh, what's the weirdest food you've ever eaten? We saw chocolate covered scorpions in the chat box. That was, um, I think one of our favorites that really stood out to us, but you see some good ones on here. Um, so thank you everyone for participating in the whiteboard, we're having a lot of fun with that. We hope you have too. So welcome, this is again, our third webinar of a four part series. Um, and as you can tell, we encourage our webinars to be very interactive. So I encourage you to contribute in our chat box as we go along. We'll be asking you questions and we're gonna have several Q&A sections with some of our presenters throughout today. So we want you to add in any thoughts to come up and we'll make sure to grab those and ask during the appropriate times to our presenters. Um, and to keep this even more interactive, I have a request for all of you. And you may be wondering what is up with this little cartoon figure in the corner, this redhead train conductor with the choo-choo. Um, well, that is me. I live by train tracks and in order to ease my Zoom audio anxieties, I'm going to ask all of you, or if you hear a train zooming by at any point and honking, I want you to do this motion, <laughs> the train choo-choo motion, um, just to, yeah, help me go along with my presentation and apologize in advance if it's distracting for folks. So that's what's going on there. Um, so going to the next slide, so I'm Elizabeth Vaughn, I'm the Senior School Food Specialist at Friends of the Earth, and I'll be your MC throughout today's session. Um, here's a snapshot of our webinar series. You'll see that we have only one webinar left after today, so we're excited to have you on, um, we're able to join today, and those who are also able to join the last two, thank you very much. We have recordings on our registration site of those first two webinars in case you missed them, so we'd love for you um, to get caught up and you can also uh, get your USDA professional standard credits by watching those recordings as well. Um, so again, we're going to be um, very interactive, add any thoughts or questions you have in the chat box as we go along. And we're also going to be asking a couple poll questions throughout today that we'd love for you to participate in. So going to the next slide, um, just an introduction to this webinar series for those of you who are new or just a good refresher um, since we're having these spread out throughout, few, throughout a few months. So we're hosting this four part webinar series to provide inspiration, resources, and support to California school districts for starting or increasing their procurement of climate friendly cuisine for your school meal programs. Um, this, there's a lot of resources, there's a lot of information we're throwing at you throughout this webinar series. So we're excited to be here to support you um, as you learn more about this and as you go about your climate friendly cuisine journey. So during today's webinar, we're going to be learning a bit more about what is climate friendly cuisine. 
We're going to do a brief recap of the January 13th webinar, just to refresh on what we learned. And we're going to learn about a really exciting new resource that Friends of the Earth just released today, the Organic School Food, a Roadmap for Success. We're going to be looking through this roadmap and the six strategies outlined available resources in the roadmap. We're going to be highlighting the power of partnerships, um, including a presentation from our nonprofit partner who supports school districts across California, Community Alliance of Family Farmers. And we'll also hear from Tahoe Chucky USD and their nutrition services director on around their strategies for procuring organic climate friendly meals. And um, we're going to be diving into some upcoming opportunities and we'll also give your USDA professional credit slide at the end. Uh, so next slide, just a bit about Friends of the Earth in case you don't know, we're an environmental nonprofit that works across the country on having food that is healthy for our kids and healthy for our planet. So we help school districts such as yourself and your communities, your stakeholders, create and promote healthy climate friendly meals that are dietary and culturally appropriate for all students. So we're here to offer you more support in that regard. Here is a brief snapshot of some of the reports that we've been releasing throughout this webinar series and how we've been supporting school districts with adopting more climate friendly meal practices. Um, so the three resources that we have highlighted here and there's more where that comes from. Um, we have our scaling up report on the far right that yellow outlined report an oldie but a goodie. It highlights different examples of climate friendly food service um, models from districts across the country and it offers a ton of great valuable information on that. And during the December 9th webinar you learned about the conscious kitchen case study, which is that one here in the middle and um, that looked at organic plant based scratch cooked school meals that are 100% organic plant forward and it highlights that it actually reduced costs and reduced packaging waste at those school sites. And today here on the left, you see that we'll be uh, talking about the organic school food a roadmap for success and releasing that resource today. Going to the next slide, we have some brief highlights from our January 13th webinar. Um, and again, this recording is available for those who missed it and want to hear from these three school districts on their climate friendly meal practices, adaptations that they were able to make during COVID. Uh, these two photos are some highlights of that. So San Luis Coastal shared the new plant forward menu line that they released last fall. And you'll see here a photo of a cost saving dish, the mighty marinara pasta with chickpeas, um, a really great dish that she was able to add into her line. Um, another box here shows Riverside Unified um, a produce box that they've been sending out. They actually received USDA funds to distribute fresh and often organic produce from their food hub out to their community. Um, so please watch that recording, learn more from these districts, and we're excited to share even more resources and districts, district experiences with you during today's webinar. Next slide. So brief little cat, like we do this every webinar and try to keep things fresh with some new examples and new talking points. Um, here's a visual of what is healthy, climate-friendly school food. We have photos here from fellow school districts across California that demonstrate that these meals are possible. We have the Thai basil lentil burger that San Luis Coastal highlighted in her last presentation, made with organic lentils from a local farm right down the road. We have the middle dish with a Mary's organic chicken drumstick highlighted, also, also climate-friendly in that they are following organic uh, practices with their animal uh, and showcasing animal welfare too. Um, and then we have a three bean chili here on the right, which skipped the one ounce cheese topping and is completely plant based and delicious and the students love it. So what is climate friendly cuisine. So when we look at these photos. Um, these are photos that demonstrate plant forward and plant based meal options. Um, and these are options that reduce animal proteins and swap in with plant proteins. These use less resources from our planet to produce these foods. And they also tend to be healthier for us. Climate friendly cuisine is also produced using organic farming practices that sequester carbon in our soil. And that also includes meat and dairy, um, including organic, some of our organic milk that we've seen here in school districts in California. Um, we also don't want the food we produce and all these resources to end up in the landfill. And this is obviously challenging during COVID, but we're seeing some awesome strategies around that. And I'll highlight a photo that actually has some compostable um, uh, serving cups in it as well. So we've been learning about climate friendly cuisine throughout the webinar series and each webinar features speakers who will share a bit more about why is it important and how climate friendly food practices can be implemented. So a bit more about why climate friendly cuisine. So why is this important? 
Um, in each webinar, we focus on a particular topic to dig a bit deeper into the benefits of climate-friendly cuisine. Um, so during December 9th's webinar, we learned that student demand is expected to increase. So there's some economic benefits towards offering these meals. The meals also tend to be at lower cost, especially if you take out the USDA foods that are supplemented. Um, in January 13th, we learned a bit about the environmental impact of our food choices. Um, and today we're gonna look at some of the health reasons behind these food choices. So this chart here is by the World Resources Institute, and it highlights the global, it highlights our global protein consumption. That black line you see is the average daily protein, protein requirement. Um, and those green columns are the proteins that come from plants with the red bars columns highlighting how much of that is coming from animal-based proteins. The horizontal axis, if you look at the far left, I know it's hard to see, but the, it has the different countries across our globe and how much protein they're consuming. So far left is India and far right, guess who it is? It's United States and Canada. So you can see there that we're consuming the most proteins of, of animal-based prod of animal -based proteins and also some of the least amount of plant-based proteins. And this raises a lot of serious concerns. Um, the share of animal-based proteins is growing in people's diets rel relative to that of plant-based proteins. And there's some health consequences that scientists are pulling out that's tied to that. And between 1961 and 2009, the global average per person availability of animal-based protein grew by 59%, while that of plant-based protein grew by only 14%. So looking forward, total consumption of animal-based protein is expected to rise by nearly 80% between 2006 and 2050. And this growth will have tremendous consequences for both the health of our communities and the health of our planet if we don't change course. So we're already consuming up to 60% more meat than is recommended by our own guidelines, US dietary guidelines. So with increased consumption of animal proteins, public health experts, researchers are warning about the possible consequences. And I have here um, some of that data. So we see that they're associated with higher risk of dying from diet related diseases. World Health Organization had some research that came out that um, showed the increased reach of several cancers that's associated with high consumption of red meat and processed meats. Um, so we can't, we can't ignore the health benefits also of climate friendly cuisine and we have to turn things around quickly before it gets worse. I also don't want us to forget that food is an impactful climate mitigation strategy that does often get it overlooked. Uh, we highlight the amount of greenhouse gas emissions <laughs> by making lunch swaps and several of our resources. And here at the bottom, I just have a quick glance at the equivalent at the equivalent savings a school district would make if they swapped out 10,000 lunches of a beef burger with a plant-based burger. And you see here that that's the equivalent of taking 63 cars off the road. Um, so we can all make a tremendous di difference, not only for our planet, but also for the health of our children, the health of our communities, if we swap to more climate-friendly meal options. On to the next slide, just another quick uh, recap of some other awesome photos. Um, we have here those compostable cups. This is a uh, Tahoe Truckee, if Kat decides to share more. She has, has some hummus there with carrots and celery. Um, and these other photos are just demonstrating the amount of um, how much effort is coming from the community and food service employees to make all of this work even possible. Um, we encourage you to watch January 13th webinar. We hear from Natomos Unified on their impressive farm to school procurement. It's awesome. Um, so this is just a snapshot of the work and it doesn't come close to capturing the efforts happening across the state. And we owe you a big thank you for all of the work that you're doing. Um, so with that, I know you guys are all in this together and despite the challenges co caused by COVID, you all are moving forward with adopting values-based procurement you're connecting with partners in your community and you're getting this food out to kids. So we can't thank you all enough for the work that you're doing. You're frontline workers, you're making a huge difference um, and what you all continue to achieve is essential. And we're honored that you're taking the time to join our webinar series today, despite all of these challenges and constraints. Um, and we'd love to stay in touch with you on your interests and how we can continue supporting you on these efforts. Um, so now going to the next slide, I'd like to introduce Leah Smith, She's an organic school food consultant to Friends of the Earth, who will guide us through successful strategies for bringing organic, climate-friendly food to your school districts. Take it away, Leah.
I think we might great. Be I'm here. I'm here. I just want to echo Elizabeth's um, expression of gratitude to everybody who's here today. We, you know, it's such an unprecedented time in school food service and you know, you're basically on your toes reinventing school food moment to moment. So we really appreciate you giving yourself this time to kind of take the step back and think about how to continue to improve the way you nourish your students. So I just want to echo that. We believe this roadmap will be especially helpful in light of a new California school food, uh, California farm to school program that provides technical and funding support for local and regional food pur purchasing. There's an $8.5 million grant program from the California Department of Food and Ag that encourages school districts to partner with producers that use climate friendly practices. And that of course includes organic farmers of those transitioning and then regenerative agriculture. So the timing is really great to roll out this resource to support school districts across the state of California and also to help um, help you all with accessing these funds. Ever so briefly, I wanna introduce myself. Um, I'm a consultant with Friends of the Earth and I have more than 20 years of experience working in the sustainable local organic food system. And really my work has focused on a lot of farm to school and farm to cafeteria projects. So I'm really pleased to be leading Friends of the Earth's organic um, school food initiative, which was launched by Friends of the Earth as part of the Climate Friendly School Group Food Program. So quickly, I wanna introduce um, the roadmap. Um, actually, I'm gonna introduce it a lot more in this presentation, but just as an overview, it was created to help school districts in their efforts to serve organic foods. And it was informed by more than 35 interviews with professionals from the school food supply chain. So distributors, um, food hub coordinators, farmers, food producers, and food service professionals. And we also had a lot of partner organizations contribute to the roadmap and inform it as well by um, interviewing those organizations that really support school food service programs. So uh, organizations that support school nutrition and menu development and farm to school programming, bid generation, you're gonna hear about some of those um, partner organizations today. The roadmap is really intended to be a very practical um, how-to guide. It has wonderful examples from seven school districts across the state of California um, of real success in the real world. So now that you've received a downloadable PDF, um, you will have received it um, today, um, you have that access to that resource and can really go further after this presentation and, and discover all that, has, that it has inside it. Elizabeth gave a, a brief recap of what we learned from webinar two, and here are some of the key um, takeaways that I heard from the three school districts that were featured in the last webinar. And it just so happens that those three school districts, for those of you who weren't able to attend the last webinar, are part of this roadmap. They were interviewed to inform the key strategies of the roadmap, and they are also featured in the case studies. So three of the seven um, really interesting, wonderful examples of different ways that they've been able to successfully procure organic food. So these are um, what we these these are many of the things that we learned, and I just want to pull out um, one of these items in particular and speak to it. Um, seizing the opportunity of the pandemic. I know it's it's a challenging time. There's a lot of unknowns in terms of timing and you know, how do we do school food service during this challenging time? And what we heard again and again from each of the three presenters last time was this is really an opportunity for us to take a step back and really answer the question, what do we want school food to look like? And what are the values that we want to embody? So there's really an opportunity here, you know, all the, the um, normal ways of doing things are kind of um, up in the air. So what do we want school food to look like on the other side of this? And I also just wanna put a plug in for the last bullet point, which is that participation rates as uh, Elizabeth illuminated too, have increased with healthy, clean, organic, local plant forward, climate friendly menus, that this is something students want more of and the foods are really appealing. They're really delicious. So um, that's a key takeaway as well. Next slide. So the roadmap, um, I just spoke about these seven school districts and I wanna, just share a little bit about what's inside. So there's a lot about, a lot of data, great data about the benefits of organic food and farming. And that's really a valuable piece 
for any food service director for their own personal learning, but also for communicating with others about why you're making the decisions that you're making for your program. There's six core strategies and those um, strategies I'm gonna be going into a, in a lot more detail in just a moment. There's seven success stories and you can see here the various districts from across the state of California that have been featured in the roadmap. They are um, from large school districts, small school districts, high free and reduced lunch numbers, low free and reduced lunch numbers, rural communities, more urban, suburban communities. So they represent a, a, a very um, wide diversity of different types of school district across the state. And I think you'll find it really helpful to learn about how they've been able to procure organic foods. And then there's loads of practical resources. Um, the, the appendix is so full of so many different um, things that you can just act, take action on. So whether it's calling up a new distributor that you're interested in learning about, being in touch with a food producer, um, co contacting somebody who you think you might want to pursue a grant with. There's so many great practical resources. So I'm going to go into that in more detail as well. So the benefits of organic food and farming, this was presented on in our first webinar by Kendra Klein, who's a senior staff scientist with Friends of the Earth. And really, um, there's so much that can be said about the benefits of organic food and farming. And this is just one data point to, um, that I wanted to pull out. There's 47 different toxic pesticide residues um, that were found on conventional apples in this, this particular USDA 2016 pesticide data program analysis. And that is really um, shocking and important to know that um, that was found by the USDA. And you know, as um, they really analyzed these different pesticide residues, six are known or probable carcinogens, 16 suspected hormone disruptors, five neurotoxins and six developmental or reproductive to toxins. And of course, none of these pesticides are found in organic food and farming. So I just wanna bring that to your attention because it can really be helpful when you're speaking to your peers, your, your staff, um, your school board to really have um, data at your hands. And I also wanted to add another um, data point, which is there were two peer reviewed studies that after just six days on an organic diet, the level of toxic pesticides in children's bodies, that includes like organophosphates and malathion, glyphosate dropped 60 to 95%. So in a very short period of time by um, having more organic food in a, in a child's diet, really you see a, a vast change and difference in, um, in how much pest, pesticide residue are found, is found in children's bodies. All right, so um, the core strategies, the six core strategies of the roadmap are make organic affordable, which this is really important. Um, this came up many, many times in conversations with all the different food service directors we interviewed. Select organic items, manage organic procurement, develop partnerships, market your program, assess kitchen infrastructure and train staff. And these six strategies, it's not a linear process. There's no start here and end here. It's start wherever you are. Um, that you know, you'll hear when I give some more examples of these strategies that different school food service directors have focused in different areas and that's perfectly fine. And what you, um, oh, here we have a poll that popped up. So what we'd love to hear from you is which of these six strategies are you most interested in learning about today? This is a multiple choice. And I think, can you select more than one? I, ho I hope you can I select. I believe they should be able to, yeah. Okay. So we'd love to hear, get a little feedback from you, get a meter reading on what you're most interested in learning about today. So we'll give you a minute here to respond to this poll. And while people are filling that out, um, we're gonna be going into more detail on these strategies and specifically on the ones that you all are most interested in. All right, well, look at that. We get to see the poll results, results instantly. So making organic affordable is top. Managing organic procurement is second. 
selecting organic, uh, uh, developing partnerships, right on. Um, then we have selecting organic items, assessing kitchen infrastructure and marketing your program. Excellent. I am noting that right now. Great. Excellent. All right, so next slide. <clears throat> so we're gonna go into make organic affordable. How can you make it organic affordable? Well, there are lots of great strategies to do that. And these are strategies that we heard repeatedly from the food service directors that we interviewed. And um, it's really valuable to understand and look at what's in season and buy items when they're in peak season. You see here this delicious strawberry that I'm sure you all wanna sink your teeth into. And when it's in season, which is not particularly right now, um, Organic strawberries can be just as competitive in their pricing as conventional and San Francisco Unified School District pointed this out um, when we interviewed them. They actually were able to buy organic strawberries from Coke Farms at the same price as the conventional strawberries at this, that time of year. Buying in bulk is another great strategy. Um, we heard from San Luis Coastal, they purchased uh, organic lentils for their organic lentil burger. And these dry good items that ha are shelf stable and have longevity that you really don't have to um, worry too much about um, buying in bulk. These are, it's a great way to get a really good price when you buy in, in larger quantities, whether it's grains or beans or lentils um, or rice, that's a great way to, to bring down the price. Reducing meat portions with blended dishes. Encinitas Unified School District has some great examples of, of using organic ground beef, but using it in smaller portions and with blended dishes. And we heard that um, you know, through the cost savings of, of serving less meat, they were able to invest those funds in buying organic meat instead of conventional meat. Serve more plant-based foods. You can see here this great um, example from um, the Conscious Kitchen study or Conscious Kitchen program where they actually were able to purchase 100% organic ingredients for these plant forward meals. And you can see these price points here on the right are pretty remarkable. The food cost per meal for these various dishes are really on target and very affordable. Increased operational efficiencies. A Riverside Unified School District Central Kitchen, as an example, washes and chops their organic local lettuce. This is in non-pandemic times um, in their central kitchen for both their salad bar and their grab-and-go salads, which is more geared towards their high school students. The salad bars are more geared towards their elementary school students. So they've found ways to be really efficient and um, process a lot of organic lettuce for their schools. Next slide. Select organic items that fit your operation. Pick the most popular items. That's a really great strategy because when you offer items that are really popular among your students, your participation rates go up. And when your participation rates go up, you have more funds coming in, you have more revenue coming into your program and that can be reinvested in purchasing more organic food. So, by bringing up participation rates, you're really also increasing your budget for making these kinds of choices. Start small. Um, Encinitas, for example, started with fresh fruits and vegetables and added one item at a time. And now they're serving organic ground beef and chicken, organic chicken. So, but her key takeaway, and this was the same thing that was repeated by Natomas, Unified School District's food service director, was start small choose one item. And, and that just seems so much more manageable for a lot of um, people than feeling like you have to do everything all at once. Choose organic items from the dirty dozen list. This list is um, from the Environmental Working Group and every year they come out with the dirty dozen list. And this is based on the USDA pesticide residue analysis that I was speaking of earlier. And you can see that a lot of foods that are really, that kids love are on this list which is all the more reason to make choices to serve these foods organic. So strawberries, top of the list, apples, very high up there, stone fruit, grapes. Um, if you, you know, wanna choose one item to start with, this is a great way to help with your selection. Determine kitchen infrastructure and capacity. So 
as an example, Morgan Hill Unified School District looked at its kitchens and, and staff and they made some investments to allow for more um, satellite kitchen preparations. So they um, decided in 2019 to feature more fresh fruits and vegetables, both through salad bars and through scratch cooking. And they decided instead of to centralize uh, the preparation, they actually decentralized it. So they were really looking at their particular infrastructure, their particular staff capacity. And other school districts might do the exact opposite. They might say, you know what, it's more efficient for us to bring it all into our central kitchen and do a lot of the prep and then send out um, already chopped um, items to our satellite, um, satellite sites. Managing organic procurement, this was high up there in your, this is the next slide. Um, high up in the, um, in the poll results. So I wanna make sure that we spend some good time here on managing organic procurement. First and foremost, understanding what you already have access to. That's a key strategy is find out, you know, which, which items that your um, distributor already carries. And if they don't carry the items that you're wanting to procure organic for, then talk to that distributor and let them know and find out if they can provide those items. And if you're not having your needs met, there's always options to increase your supply options, whether it's with um, forming some direct relationships with regional producers, um, adding another distributor. Many of the school districts that we interviewed worked with multiple distributors. It's very um, uncommon, at least I found, um, with the folks that are procuring organic that they really solely focus with one distributor. So um, increasing supply options, buying direct from producers, this is a great way um, both to establish a relationship, learn what's coming in season. Um, buying direct from producers allows you to also, you know, inform your menus about, you know, kind of develop your menus as the seasons change. And it also allows you to negotiate prices. When you have that direct relationship and the investment and the commitment to that relationship is there, negotiating prices becomes um, a possibility as well. CAF, who's going to be presenting this afternoon or in a little bit, um, using contracting to serve organic goals, they are really um, quite the experts on helping school districts with um, creating an RFP and really putting together um, language that serves in, in your um, our request for proposals to serve your organic goals. So I'm going to let CAF speak to that in greater detail, and it's a great strategy for um, increasing organic um, items in your menu. Advocate for organic and USDA school food program or USDA food programs. Friends of the Earth, one of the things that Friends of the Earth is incredibly skillful at is knowing when to advocate for policy change. And we know that if your fresh fruits and vegetable program or the DOD Fresh program, if those programs had more organic options, it would really open the floodgates for more school districts to be procuring organic food. So we wanna partner with you to advocate and we need your voice and your experience to do so. Develop partnerships, engage partners and get support. There are so many different fantastic organizations that are out there. These are just a handful of organizations that we interviewed and that are featured in the roadmap and they can definitely help with things that you want help with, whether it's menu development, nutrition analysis, um, with farm to school programming, a lot of these partners are very um, keen on working with school districts. CDFA, Office of Farm to Fork, we talked about that funding opportunity, um, the Good Food Purchasing Program, CAF. These are all organizations that are on your side, want to support the good work that you're doing. Updating your wellness policy is really a cross um, district partnering opportunity. Uh, your wellness policy really brings everybody together across your district to get on the same page. And it's an opportunity to really put into words, put into um, policy the, the commitment that your district wants to embrace around procuring organic. And then obtaining funding to support innovation. There's many grants, and I'm gonna go into that a, a little bit further, um, but there are many grants that are out there to support the work that you're trying to do. Market your program. There's so much um, that's been done and 
here are some great examples. We heard about the Thai basil lentil burger, which is just this amazing looking, tempting lentil burger. And they've been really marketing that. And, and one of the key takeaways that I had was, it's not just called a lentil burger or a veggie patty. It's called a Thai basil lentil burger. And so really, um, you know, using marketing strategy to really uh, appeal to your students. I just saw somebody say, looks amazing. Um, yes, it sure does. The tomato soup, you can see that it's organic and dairy free. So this tomato soup is really marketed to the students who really care about organic and local and wheat free. And then that strawberry, gosh, I just wanna reach through the screen and grab that strawberry because it looks so delicious. This again is San Francisco Unified School District and they have just a, a regular Instagram account that they are posting on an ongoing basis, telling the story that they are sourcing from Coke farms and these st strawberries are organic and in season and local. And um, so they really tell their story um, on an ongoing basis. They also had a great post when they launched their um, bulk milk, um, bulk organic milk from Strauss Family Creamery. They had a great story about um, Strauss Family Creamery and um, that it's a local business and all the practices that they um, um, do in such a fantastic way. And then celebrate with your community. Of course, it's really important to celebrate success and to really um, honor um, the work that you're doing by celebrating with your community, whether it's um, celebrating by, um, you know, having a, an event or a holiday celebration or having an entire week dedicated to eat a rainbow. Um, these are all great ways to market and um, encourage people to continue to participate in your program. So um, assess kitchen infrastructure and train staff. There's a, a lot that could be said here. Um, Kat, who is going to be presenting in a little bit, she just completed a really exciting kitchen infrastructure project. So I'm going to leave more on that um, for Kat. But um, really building skills to support the change that you want to see in your in your um, cafeteria programs, purchasing the equipment that you need, getting those grants, and then planning for bigger investments. And lastly, practical resources. So we really hope that you will draw from the roadmap, which is chock full of real world strategy for organic school food procurement. And we know that providing these tools for implementation is really key. We can't just say, oh, this is a great thing, you, you know, go ahead and go out and do it. But these are really the practical tools to make it happen. So there's um, practical resources on procurement, on funding, on partnerships. Um, you can um, advance to the next item, that, thank you. Um, on furthering your own education about the importance and the value of organic food and farming. And then lastly, there's so much inspiration, all these great case studies on the various school districts that were included in the in interviews that we did to inform the roadmap. So there's a lot in there. We wanna encourage you to dig deep and find what you need to help support your program. Next slide. And last, but by no means least, I wanna leave you with what is the recipe for success? What does it take to make organic happen in your school district? These are the common threads that we heard about. Passionate leadership, a commitment to student health, dedicated staff, supportive school board, uh, creative use of entitlement dollars is really, um, really key. Strategic marketing and effective student engagement and better policies and funding to support organic. So I wanna leave you with that um, and open it up for questions and answers. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Leah, for going, providing that awesome overview of what's inside our organic roadmap. And um, we had some questions that were coming through the chat box as you were presenting, and we definitely have a few minutes to um, check in on some of those. And I know there were some questions about like, give me this recipe um, for this Thai basil lentil burger. It's a big hit. Um, and we're happy to email you um, those recipes directly because we also would love to share um, some corresponding marketing resources that we're providing to school districts. We have some cool lentil postcards. Um, so we'd love for you to email us at Climate Friendly Food um, for any of these recipes. You can maybe have Emma put in that email into the chat box so people can contact us directly for any um, particular resources you're wanting to get your hands on. Um, Leah, so some of these questions um, that came through, you know, there was one question that was talking about 
I believe this person's up in Washington and they were looking for strategies maybe in other states where, you know, the organics produce may be harder to come by, um, but I bet at least Washington state has lots of great organic produce. Um, and it can be more difficult during different times of the year, especially during the summer, you know, and it's a much smaller uh, meal operation and school's out for session. Um, and so they're asking, you know, what advice um, we would provide for this district. Um, and I do have a couple things I'd like to share and then Lee, if uh, you'd like to add to it. And then um, I know CAF is probably has some ideas too they can share during their presentation. Um, but I know that, you know, first getting that seasonality calendar is a big, is a big first step just to know what's in season and what's being grown in your particular region so you know what to look out for. Um, and then once you understand that there's school districts here in California, because we have a lot of produce that's coming in harvest during the summer as well. Um, one school district in Sanitas actually, I think they told me once they had 600 pounds of tomatoes in the summer and they didn't know what to do with it. Um, mm -hmm. So they turned it into a marinara sauce put it in the freezer. Um, luckily they had enough freezer space. I know that can be a challenge in itself. And they are able to have that be a meal then and for the fall semester. Um, so, you know, getting creative with how you can maybe do some pre-prep, how you can freeze some produce. Um, one district shared that they were able to get some wild blueberries through USDA Brown Box. Um, I don't think they are certified or organic, but hearing wild blueberries, and if it's like a very unique variety of blueberries, I'm like, where are these blueberries coming from? They got to be not, you know, coming from too large of a farm, probably from some smaller farm. Um, so there's some options out there that school districts have been able to work with. Um, and I don't know if you'd like to add anything to that particular question, Leah. No, I think you you covered it really well. I think, yeah, finding out what's in season, what's available locally in Washington, since your, your food shed is you know, a different region of, of the US and really, um, tr you know, try to find some farms that you might want to work with or organizations that can support um, the work that you're doing as well. I, I also think it's great to um, understand more about what's available through the various distributors in your area. If, you know, if you aren't able to find items through your current distributor, um, there's that opportunity and that next um, bid process, bidding process to expand your options and to require more um, organic and local options through, um, through your re request for proposals from distributors. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then another thing I saw come through the chat, which I'm not sure if this person is also based in California or in another state, but they were asking about USDA's goal as far as organic produce offerings, especially around DOD. Um, and I know I saw Ben and Yusef from CAF responding to this bit, so appreciate you guys being available to support these folks. Um, in California, we are one of the states participating in that unprocessed fresh food and vegetable pilot program that you see Yusef has posted here. Um, and school districts who are in that program are allowed to go out to bid and have their own, have their own specifications listed, so they're able to use those funds to procure organic produce through those distributors. And CAF um, is an expert on these topics, so they can speak more to that if there's additional questions. Um, we know CDFA and those farm to school grant funds that are being released um, are, they do have a goal of supporting more orga organic and climate smart agriculture. So they have organic, they have regenerative, they have those awesome words listed in that um, request for applications that's out right now. Um, so we see the shift happening at a federal level. I don't know if there's any particular goals around organic, but Friends of the Earth wants there to be goals. Um, so we are hoping that we can get as many of you on today's webinar and at the webinar on February 10th. We're interested in doing this federal advocacy to get involved, um, to join that webinar, because we'd love to work with you to see how we can make this a goal and make these options more expansive for you. Um, so definitely, uh, yeah, I wanted to provide that response to that. Um, Leah, anything to add before we move on? Yeah, I would just add that the Unprocessed Fresh Fruits and Vegetable Pilot Program is where we are seeing some organic available. And that's actually where San Francisco Unified School District was able to procure their Coke Farm organic strawberries. So. We've seen a lot of Coke Farms um, products. They are definitely onboarded into the um, Unprocessed Fresh Fruits and Vegetable Pilot Program. So I think there are also opportunities to help producers with getting into that program that are organic. Um, so that I think there's a real opportunity there to expand organic availability in that program. Awesome. All right. And um, we're going to have CAF present here towards the end of today, too. So if there's more procurement questions that come up, um, get those ready and we can maybe cover some of those after their presentation. Um, but for now, we'll be moving along. 
Um, so love to introduce here our next speaker. And um, this is she, this is one of our school districts that is highlighted within the organic roadmap. So we have a great example case study highlighting all the amazing work of Tahoe Chucky um, Unified, and they have such a cool model. And yeah, so now I'd like to introduce the director of food and nutrition services at Tahoe Chucky, Kat. She'll be highlighting her journey towards climate friendly cuisine. Um, and we were so excited to hear from her. And during her presentation, if you have any questions that you really want to ask Kat, please throw them in the chat because we're hoping to have a couple minutes at the end of her presentation um, to go over those with her. So please add those in the chat. And Kat, I'll let you take it from here. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? My heater's on full blast. It's freezing up here. Yeah. Um, um, it does take a team. I'm Kat Sultamrad. I'm a registered dietitian and I'm the director of food services um, here in Truckee. Um, all of our um, staff are on snow day today, so no one is in the kitchens. Um, otherwise, I would have planned to um, speak from one of our um, updated kitchens, which is pretty neat. Um, so it's just me today. Um, our, a little bit about our district is um, <clears throat> we're pretty big in terms of um, geography. We cover about 723 square miles um, and three counties, Placer, Nevada, and um, El Dorado. We have 12 schools under our district. Um, in addition, we have about five vended contracts through school food service um, through um, our county community day school program, charter schools, private schools. Head Start programs, um, so we pretty much feed a lot of a lot of education um, uh, organizations and programs here. Our district budget is about 69 million. We are a basic aid district. I <clears throat> noticed um, on the um, roadmap, the districts under the roadmap, out of the seven, three of us are basic aid districts. So it makes a difference in terms of um, how the community really advocates and provides input. I've worked in many districts um, that are not basic aid and, and definitely there's, there's more participation in my opinion um, with basic aid districts and from parents, which, which I welcome. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Our food services um, budget goes anywhere between three and 4 million. Probably next year it will go higher um, based on our labor costs. Um, this year, um, from March to December, we've had 250,000 meals cooked, baked, served, delivered. Our enrollment is always around 4,000. We're open enrollment. This year, our free and reduced is matching our 2012 free and reduced, um, which was at 46%. In a non-COVID year, in the last five years, we've been at about 30%. Um, so COVID has really hit hard our little community here. Um, in terms of um, uh, job loss, um, housing is a big issue here. There's not a lot of housing opportunities um, for folks um, who work in the service industries, um, such as food service. Our home to school transportation, 75% of our students, sometimes more, use the bus. Um, we have 35 buses and 25 um, routes. Our um, board and community determined about eight years ago to subsidize busing. So our director there uses the USDA income guidelines for school meals, and um, she's done a great job where they offer free, reduced, and paid bus passes. So that's really great for our kiddos. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here's our team. We had a great group here. And collectively, I think we have like 500 years of experience with it in this group, both um, back of house and front of house. Um, the average years of service for anyone here is eight years. I don't have anyone who hasn't been here more than eight years um, in our department. Uh, Danny, top right, we love her. She's been here 33 years, only in food service. So she was here even before we were in the National School Meal Program as a district. The gentleman next to her, Rusty, he's actually a, um, a trained chef. A wonderful, wonderful chef who works at a lot of the restaurants here as the head chef. Uh, he works like 15 hour days, it's incredible, but um, he's also a parent. Um, we have about uh, 20 um, full-time employees. Um, I'm sorry, we have about 19 full-time employees, one part-time employee, which we're trying to move to full-time. Um, what I really wanna stress here is that 
we're really fortunate that we have full-time positions, benefited positions, a livable wage, even though it's really expensive up here. Um, and people come and stay in our department. We don't have a revolving door, which helps tremendously. We can build upon our menus, our recipes, our experiences, as opposed to constantly retraining um, in terms of um, bringing in new folks. Um, our partners are our warehouse members. Um, custodians clean, mop, sweep, they empty all the trash. They take care of all the compost front and back of house in the kitchens. Um, we have a really great uh, relationship with um, our partners. And here we have our bus drivers, our warehouse, um, and all of our food service um, uh, heroes, truly. Um, I'm gonna touch upon um, the um, roadmap strategies that we, we feel like we've come a long way. And, I, and towards the end of my presentation, I'll share with you um, the areas that we're really looking to focus on in the next couple of years. Um, Miguel asked um, six hours or eight hours. Um, Danny's the only eight hour employee. Everyone else is six and a half to seven and a half hours. Um, and, and they're fully benefited after in our district after five and a half hours. Um, we use uh, affordable organics. Uh, our food hub is amazing. Without our food hub, 90% of what I'm sharing today would not have happened. Um, Cisco Sacramento is, is working really closely and diligently with us. Um, I've noticed in our ordering guides every week, um, they're posting um, if it's California grown, um, how local is it um, in terms of the produce. So I'm really grateful for that. Produce Plus um, is a small provider and distributor out of Kings Beach. Um, Bob Habiger has been a resident of 45 years. His kids went to our district. Um, they're wonderful. Sierra Harvest um, is down the hill in Auburn, Grass Valley. And um, they partner with us and they keep us in mind for grants. And then we have a, we've had two grocery stores, okay, or three in, in the 20 years that I've been here. And um, in the, this summer, we got two new ones a grocery outlet, and a Rayleigh's. And Rayleigh's, this is a new flagship store for them called the One Market. And they, they really align um, their, their mission with what they offer in their supermarket. Um, and I'll let you look that up in terms of um, purchasing organic, purchasing um, foods that are low in pesticide, things like that. Next slide, please. Um, Tahoe Food Hub, this is Susie Sufton here. Again, she's our mentor and our leader. I mean, um, she came from Patagonia and she, she came here with just blazing guns and said, we need a food hub up here and I'm gonna, I'm gonna start it. And she did. And um, she has brought together um, restaurants, chefs, the school district, um, all of the local providers within a hundred miles of our school district. And, um, every year we just get better and better in terms of being to source organic. Um, for example, we have local kiwis um, that I would have been purchasing more um, and you'll see why I, I stopped this year because of Rayleigh's. Um, we have mandarins. You can see the significant difference in terms of um, what Tahoe Food Hub sources for us and delivers to our warehouse. They would deliver to every school site um, if we asked them to do that, but we don't need to do that. Um, and we're just really grateful for their partnership here. Um, those are just a couple of items. We get pears, strawberries, spinach, cabbage, persimmons. I gotta say, they're not popular amongst the kids, but we try every year. Grapefruit, blood oranges are coming up in a month. Um, we've had a nine year partnership with them. Um, they really advocate for local and fair wages for the farmers and producers. Um, they've also started a giving box program since COVID began. Um, you can read more about that on their website, but we have been a recipient as a district to about 70 giving boxes every week. It's organic produce to feed a family of four, and we have uh, 90 families on a wait list. I have to rotate that list, the worst part of my job, every week, um, but at least a family gets a box once a week delivered by myself, our cooks, or bus drivers. We pick up, this is our fleet of vans, um, from the hub in their warehouse every Thursday morning at nine. And we make our deliveries to um, all of the, uh, the families that are in severe need um, and have food insecurity since May. So 
we're pushing upwards of 2,500 giving boxes. Um, and we had to postpone tomorrow's giving box, it'll snow more, but we'll do it again on Friday. Um, Rayleigh's um, working really closely with another awesome partner, our local hospital, Tahoe Forest Hospital, has led our Harvest of the Month program since 2006. They raise the money, they work with PTOs, and now our district, each entity provides one third of the funding um, along with um, SNAP Ed funds the hospital will get. Um, this year, Rayleigh's being just built, wanted to really build a, a community relationship. They're donating all of the Harvest of the Month produce for nine months, delivering to our warehouse, and then food services preparing the taste test, we're putting it in the meal bags with recipe cards um, for teachers and families to try at home. And these Kiwis are outstanding. I can't, I, I couldn't speak more of them. Someone from Bellevue, um, I don't know uh, what city um, the um, first fruit farm is from, but the apples we got from them are from Washington. They were amazing through Rayleigh's. Um, so that might be some, someone to check in with if you haven't already. Um, the sweet potatoes, I'm not gonna lie. Danny was the first to give me a hard time. You want me to peel and roast all these sweet potatoes? I'm like, you can do it. You've done way more. Um, and so they did. I mean, they, they really, really knocked it out of the park. Excuse all the plastic. Um, with COVID, we are not using reusable trays, um, plates, or forks and utensils. Um, this was at the start of our hybrid back in October, and then we closed. Um, we actually got to do the sweet potatoes in the classroom. Uh, some of the feedback that we got um, is here. So we roasted them, very simple recipe, a little bit of honey mixed up with a little bit of uh, salt and pepper. We threw it in the oven, bam, we were done. Um, and, and we went from there. Thanks for the time. I talk a lot, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Next slide. Um, this is Alejandra. She's been a uh, cook with us uh, six years um, and she was a sub before that. She's making the food hub deliveries um, because our bus drivers were back in hybrid, um, uh, but we, we are really, really fortunate to have such a great uh, community and partnership. Most people approach us, we don't have to approach them. Um, that's how much everyone is invested, even if they don't have children in our district. Um, what do we do for marketing? Um, and um, both at school and for parents, our superintendent um, has been really involved in our program and it's wonderful our board members, we get a lot of media coverage um, and, and we're constantly putting our um, recipes out there for parents. We're constantly reaching out to our local paper to say, hey, look what we're doing. Um, and we hope that they would publish something and that helps us a lot. Um, so we had two bond measures because we're in two different counties passed, really generous community. Um, I couldn't get the total amount on the bond measures, but I'm gonna say it's over 200 million at the end of the day. And I'm only showing you the kitchens that I have pictures of. We have three other kitchens that were updated. The first one is at elementary school. Um, and then the second one, this is the culinary school. Their entire school's bond cost was 63 million. This is the culinary school updated kitchen, which is amazing. Um, so we have two great culinary high school programs um, that we're really proud of and we partner with them too. And here's our team. We had a lot of donations from North Star, Squaw, um, when the pandemic hit because they couldn't use their food, we took advantage of it. Um, and here on the left, um, you can see the, the boxes of food. We were, anything that they had, we boxed up and give, gave away with our, with our meal. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kat. So inspiring. Um, and we just have maybe a minute for some Q&A. Unfortunately, we are running a bit behind, but we did have um, some and, and, and a question I would like to ask you, which are what are the challenges for urban districts? Um, I know you've worked at a lot of different districts, Kat, so I don't know if you, um, how you feel about responding to that. I'm sorry, can you, what was the first part? Oh, sorry, what are the challenges for urban districts? For an urban district or we're, we're a rural district, so. Um, right. Have, yeah. Um, wait, have you worked at, uh, have you had a difference by in the different positions that you've had at different school I did, districts? I did. I, I come from Southern California and um, I worked in really big districts there. And the biggest challenge was um, getting community support, getting parents to attend 
um, meetings or school board um, meetings to make sure that it wasn't just um, food service advocates or nutrition advocates asking for the change. That was a big challenge for me. Um, and, and I think with um, Michelle Obama, there was the conversation and change in food service just, it made it easier. It made it easier um, than what we were dealing with 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, what was it? Just 20 years ago, we were trying to get soda out of school. So um, a lot has changed. The, the, um, the tone and environment is right for, for this work. So it's great. That's awesome. Thank you. And I know we have a couple other amazing questions that just came through, but unfortunately we do, we need to move on. Um, so thank you thank so much, you. Kat. And um, if you're able to stay on and if other people want to keep asking questions in the chat, uh, please feel free to do that. And um, Kat, if you're open to responding to those in the chat box, that would be wonderful. Um, but we'll move on. We're going to, we're going to get back to Leah, who's going to be talking about different pathways of support. So I'll hand it back to Leah. Great. So now that the Organic School Food Roadmap is actually available and in your hands, um, we're really excited to be shifting more of our attention, the Organic School Food Initiative's attention to providing technical assistance to school districts who are primed and ready and want to begin to procure organic foods. And there are several ways that we can help, not the least of which is connecting you with other partner organizations who are um, have a specific area of expertise that can support the work in, in the areas that you would like support in. But here are some of the ways that Friends of the Earth can help. We can help with identifying items, um, organic items that are of comparable price um, so that you can source those organically. We can work with current or alternative distributors and help you work with your current or an alternative distributor to source or get specific organic items. We're able to assist with organic contracting language, but truthfully, CAF is really um, the expert in this. So we're happy to help connect you with CAF, get you started, but really hand you um, into CAF's trusty hands to help with that organic contracting language. We're able to help with identifying farms and CAF also is a great support with um, this as well to source from and organic product options. In the roadmaps appendices, we have tons of great um, organic product options and farms identified that you can source organic products from. We heard about the organic lentils. There's also been some great organic milk, bulk milk. Um, so we're able to kind of connect you and help you uh, figure out how to begin the process of purchasing some of those items. Marketing materials and ideas for promoting organic, that's another great way that we can help provide support. There are also other organizations that can provide support in the marketing realm as well that we can connect you with. And, and policy advocacy support. As I mentioned earlier, that's really one of the strengths of Friends of the Earth is really to support um, you around not just um, federal policy advocacy work that we were talking about earlier with trying to change some of the USDA food programs, but local adv advocacy, whether it's with your school board um, or at the county or state level, we're here to, to work with you. And these, each of these technical assistance pieces really ties back to the roadmap strategies. So I just want to let you know that we're really keen on, on providing the technical support so that you can utilize these strategies for success. Um, sorry, I wasn't quite ready for the poll question to come up. So um, the poll question popped up already, but what I would like to um, speak to for just a few minutes before you answer that poll is how um, we offer technical assistance. So we actually um, have you complete a technical assistance readiness survey, and we have an initial phone call with you to really understand what it is that your goals are, what your priorities are, what your timeline is, so that we can set realistic measurable goals to help you accomplish your, um, what you're wanting to accomplish in your program. We create a partnership agreement so that it's clear what Friends of the Earth is offering, what you're offering, what you're bringing to the table, the work that you're gonna engage in. And we work together to achieve your goals, whether that means doing research to help you find a product, um, initiating, helping you to initiate new relationships, um, identifying products, even um, with helping you to begin that first step. And then we conduct um, check-in calls to track progress and evaluate and adjust your goals so that we're really helping to set you up for success. 
And then finally, together with you, we wanna celebrate your accomplishments. We feel that it's really important at each step um, that you find success happening to celebrate and really um, take a step back and really um, enjoy the moment of, of your success. So now, now that the poll um, is still up there and uh, we'd love to know if you are interested in receiving technical assistance for your school district, whether that's to support an increase in climate friendly cuisine or organic procurement, um, any of those items listed there, please let us know that this is really great feedback for us so that we know um, who to follow up with. Awesome. And thank you. And we have that poll still up. So for those of you um, who maybe don't see it, this is an opportunity for you um, to participate in this and we'll be able to follow up with you directly um, based off these poll results to see how we can support you. Um, and always feel free to email us as well. I've been putting our email in the chat box if there's any particular recipes or additional information that you would like um, from what you learned today. All right, so we are now moving forward. Thank you, Leah, for going over that and how um, one pathway of support with Friends of the Earth. There's a lot more where that comes from, not just Friends of the Earth. We have nonprofits across the state, across our country who are here to support the school districts on uh, making these shifts. Um, so as the saying goes, it really does take a village, um, especially when goals are tied into the complex food system that we are all a part of. And partnerships with community organizations are a key ingredient for success in serving organic and climate friendly foods. And I'm honored to now introduce one of those key partners we have available here in California. You've already seen them in action through chat box responses, the Community Alliance with Family Farmers. And they've been supporting school districts and making the shift towards more healthy and sustainable foods and supporting our small sustainable farmers here in San Diego, or San Diego, in California. Um, so if any questions come to mind during their presentation, uh, we encourage you to add those to the chat box. We'll have a couple minutes at the end of their presentation for Q&A. Some procurement questions have already come up, have already come up so we can dig further um, into those during the Q&A as well. And maybe we'll hear more during their presentation. Um, but I will now be handing over the mic to Ben and Yusa from CAF who will show us more what they're doing and how they're supporting. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thanks so much for to the Friends of the Earth uh, team for having us today. Um, we're going to keep the intros light because we were um, grateful for the mentions today and, and also have gotten to work with a number of folks uh, on the webinar. Um, we are going to go through, uh, well, actually, let me first start by introducing myself and Yusuf can do the same thing. Uh, I'm Ben Thomas. I'm the Farm to Market Program Director at CAF and have been working with schools uh, on local procurement for the past six years. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Yusuf Bouzian. I'm the Farm to Cafeteria Program Manager at CAF, helping link uh, school districts to local farmers in their area. And I've been at CAF for the last three years. Awesome. Um, also want to give a big shout out to Celeste for an incredible, uh, sharing an incredible story. We're, we haven't had a chance to work with her, but we're connected um, recently on procurement compliance and supporting bid work. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that today. Um, really briefly going to say who we are, uh, talk about a Farm to School Action Guide Envisioning Roadmap, which are two um, very complementary resources that we've been developing in partnership with the Edible Schoolyard. Uh, to the Friends of the Earth Organic Roadmap that was released today. And, and congrats to that team for putting out uh, that resource and all the hard work that's gone into that. Um, we're gonna talk about a few different upcoming opportunities uh, for partnership and technical assistance from our team, and then give some time, a little bit of time for Q&A. Um, so this is uh, CAF's, uh, CAF's uh, mission, it's to advocate for family farmers and sustainable agriculture, we strive to build a movement of rural and urban people to foster family scale agriculture that cares for the land, sustains local economies and promotes social justice. So just a little bit of background about CAF as a whole. Um, we've been uh, an organization that supports family farmers in California for over 40 years. And we have a broad range of programs from climate smart farming support to policy advocacy uh, to our farm to market team. Um, and within our farm to market program, uh, we do a lot of work around farm to cafeteria work, supporting farmers connect uh, with school districts, hospitals and universities and other institutions. Um, we've uh, began in the farm to cafeteria space uh, several years ago and uh, have 
begin, begin early on with work around uh, food core, which uh, many, many folks may have heard of, um, as well as being one of the beginning orgs that led the California Farm to School Network. Um, in recent years, we've worked with over 100 districts uh, in supporting them on procurement regulations, uh, help, uh, help with building RFPs, informal bids, connections for micro purchases, procurement procedures, um, and other ways to support districts from buying direct, um, as simply as just connecting them with farmers to their area into, uh, into more complicated things like deep diving on local procurement regulations. Um, yes, that's, uh, that's our Farm to Cafeteria program. And so to get into the, the resources that we're going to share today, um, we've spent the last two years in partnership with Edible Schoolyard and Stockton Unified School District uh, Child Nutrition and Food Services to take a deep dive into uh, doing an assessment around uh, farm to school and how it, specifically within the lens of how we could uh, help develop building towards a more organic and local school food program. Um, and really do that in a more holistic approach. And with that, we're not only tr about to release the findings on the assessment and the uh, tools that came out of that that I'll talk a little bit more about, but we also uh, are modeling these, each of these as tools for school districts around the state to use and developing a couple of programs around them to work with partners and school districts like I'll do on the, on the webinar today. And, and hopefully a lot of those um, that we know are increasingly interested in this uh, next shift in school food to be able to support that for our students in our communities. Uh, the first big uh, bucket of tools and modeling was what we called an action guide. And so that was doing uh, deep dive assessments, not only on procurement, which is what we typically do with school districts that we work with to help them look at their purchasing and start to identify how they can make shifts, um, but looking at all across different uh, aspects of operations. So from operations and meal programs, facilities, equipment, and transportation, uh, deep, deeper dives into some of that like salad bars, uh, staffing and professional development, menu development, student and community engagement, uh, and uh, how to consider how we can create a process of goal setting and a process of modeling how to assess your own district's program um, to help everybody who's either at the very, very beginning of this and hopefully also the folks that are really in advanced in this to be able to make a plan for how to move the dial with some more support and then to connect those uh, from those goals into resources to be able to help you achieve them. So that included uh, a cost shift analysis. So looking at what you're currently purchasing, uh, in this case, what Stock Unified was purchase, currently purchasing, um, looking at real supply chain opportunities for uh, what organic options are available in different progressive ways of purchasing from existing distributors to direct, uh, and really being able to determine side by side what the value of what's currently being purchased and what they could potentially purchase is in terms of budget for the school district. Looking at that both in terms of processed and whole produce, and as well as looking at some other um, grocery and protein items. That the cost shift analysis is one of the things that we're the, the most excited about because it really helps you more granularly look at what you want to incrementally change each year, track the, the budget of, and be able to make investments in processing um, if that's possible, or even in, in production kitchens if that's possible over time to be able to have a guide to make some of those shifts to more organic uh, and local produce. Um, this is a visioning roadmap. Um, which I'm going, we're going to show you in just a moment, but is a goal setting tool that we're actually looking for some partners to pilot on. Um, we'll talk more about that. We've lined up a whole bunch of different professional development opportunities to have a more of a central um, resource for food service directors to be able to look to um, many of the awesome experts and leaders and partners that from chefs to organizations to other food service directors that you've been, uh, that, that food service directors have been developing over the years that we've worked with. A handful of case studies, some overlapping with Friends of the Earth and some, some new, so in some similar and different findings. So that was a cool addition. Um, and then conclusions and recommendations on how all of that applied to uh, what Stockton Unified could do and, and hopefully that other districts can do as well. Um, next I'll share in the visioning roadmap. 
Um, Bianca uh, is actually going to share the visioning roadmap draft. So this is the first public showing of our resource. And you'll, you'll see that it's a little complicated in its current format, but I hope you'll get the gist of it. And we'll, we'll tell you where it's going. Thank you so much, Bianca. Um, the visioning roadmap, Bianca, if you want to scroll solely from left to right for a moment, is a three phase, three tier in each phase, progressive goal setting map of moving towards more local and organic and farm to school programming in a school district uh, operation. And this is across an, what added up to about 70 different categories. And those are each of the rows. And so Bianca, if you wanna scroll down now, um, we, can show, we can show those as well. So it, from procurement, you see some different procurement categories, produce, proteins, you can keep scrolling down um, to uh, keep, keep going. Thank you so much to operations. Um, scratch and speed cooking, preservation, equipment and facilities to student education and engagement. So you can see it's pretty robust. Um, classroom education and engagement. We even have a section on design of the cafeteria space. And all of these are, are um, including all different areas of each of those sections. The last one's on funding and policy change that school food service directors can look to in terms of expanding and progressively building their program in a way that isn't uh, moving too fast and takes into account where they're at in all of these different areas. The uh, column B that when we scroll up, we'll see some more information in is professional development topics that relate to each of these. Um, you can go back when you're, when you're ready, Bianca, to the, to the slide. Um, so what we're doing with this it obviously is pretty unwieldy when you see it right now. Um, we're taking this and turning it into an interactive tool that you can use to set your own goals, share them with other school districts and share your progress, and then be able to um, be, have those, that process take you to resources that can help you achieve them. And I think just to wrap up on that, um, we'll come back to the, the piloting opportunity in just a moment so we can go to the next slide. We're looking for three to four districts and, and also have the opportunity for more if, if folks are interested in, in doing evaluation. The interactive roadmap evaluation has been pretty expansive so far in terms of partners and a few food service directors, um, but now we have to turn it into a tool that folks can use. So if anybody here on the call is interested in piloting that early or later in phase of, of trying out that tool to please um, reach out to us and our emails are on the last page. We're also available, as was mentioned on the call today, to help support in purchasing from local uh, organic farms and food hubs and other uh, distributors that support them. So anytime that anybody's interested, we're happy to make those connections and, and uh, more than eager to work with Friends of the Earth to do that. I'm gonna just take a second here to talk about our bid generator platform. Um, the bid generator is a platform that CAF has been developing. Um, to try and streamline the RFP creation process. So as I'm sure you all know, trying to create an RFB or an informal bid or IFB or even my, uh, you know, any, any real contracting can be tricky. Um, CAF is simplifying the process through a bid generator form where food service directors can fill out a, a, a simple survey and those answers would automatically populate um, an RFP and CAF works to create that RFB that RFP um, up to the district's preferences and specifications, uh, primarily trying to specify uh, local California procurement and organic procurement. In addition, we also have resources to help you create it within the bid generator to help you create um, procurement procedures and code of conduct that can, uh, in, that can incorporate local and organic products, as well as uh, resources to help create your item list that would emphasize uh, organic items or incorporating evaluation criteria for local. So here's uh, the picture here is uh, myself with um, the folks at South San Francisco Unified School District. They're one of the, our first, uh, the first districts we worked with to help create this platform. And they've been uh, giving us a lot of feedback throughout this process. And we've been consistently trying to work with food service directors to help us uh, create a tool that would work for food service staff. 
Um, so we're currently seeking uh, any school districts that are interested in being a part of that process and providing us evaluation and resources, uh, any, any evaluation on the resources that we're creating. And uh, if any districts don't necessarily want to be a uh, part of the bid generator for providing evaluation, but uh, would still like procurement support, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, and then another opportunity is uh, we always uh, like to support, uh, we always like to uh, market the local purchases that we, uh, we help, help make and connect. Um, so we have a whole suite of different uh, farm to cafeteria signage there to highlight farmers uh, in your area um, that you purchase from, as well as uh, promoting different educational aspects for students in the cafeteria, or you could post it at, uh, at pickups. Um, so if you're interested in any of that, please let us know. Awesome, thank you so much, um, Ben and Yusuf for going over more of CAF's work. And um, I know a lot of school districts have already been working with you guys. And I see that Kat from Tahoe wants to sign up and get involved with um, that opportunity. Um, and one of the questions that popped up earlier um, that I wanted to ask you both, I think folks on the call would be interested. Um, if there's any like upcoming discussions or additional resources for food hubs in particular, um, and how school districts can maybe um, start utilizing food hubs uh, you know, from the start or maybe expand. If, I don't know if you guys um, have additional thoughts on that. That was a question earlier. Um, yeah, so um, we actually uh, work with uh, a bunch of different food hubs throughout the state. We're actually working on a local food promotions program right now to try and support uh, different food hubs accessing school districts. Oftentimes, food hubs have been uh, more of an option for uh, things like restaurants and not necessarily institutional sales, um, but we are working with uh, eight different food hubs throughout the state on that project. Um, and ideally with food hub purchases, there's a good opportunity to start with going the micro purchase route, trying to make a couple of micro purchases potentially from different farmers through the hub. And then if those are successful, there's opportunities to expand into some informal bids or uh, even potentially make a gr good faith agreements for longer term commitments. Um, but if you are interested in working any food hubs, uh, working with any food hubs or purchasing from them, please let us know and we can connect you with food hubs in your area and kind of get that ball rolling. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I know we had another question here from, from Leah, but I, I think we'll need to move on for, for timing. I don't think I've seen any other questions come through from the school districts. Um, so thank you so much, Ben and Yusuf, for that presentation, for going over all the awesome support avenues and pathways that are available through CAF. Um, and that's just one small peek for all the folks on the call. There's lots of other nonprofits out there. An organic roadmap has a list of those, actually, especially the ones that are based in California that are available to support. So uh, once you get that roadmap open, we encourage you to look through the resources to see uh, which, you know, which partners which opportunities may fit best for your region and for your district. Um, so looking at future opportunities here, we wanna make sure everyone is aware of 2021 is full of opportunities. Um, hopefully this will be the year where we can have COVID be behind us too, um, but there are some upcoming opportunities we wanna make sure everyone's aware of. So the Center for Eco Literacy is planning to offer a virtual plant forward culinary training for food service staff in late spring. Details are still being worked out, but we have the contact here on our um, slide and it'll be posted in the chat box for those who wanna follow up with the Center for Eco Literacy. The Culinary Institute of America is also hosting their Global Plant Forward Summit um, starting March 30th. And I've heard amazing things from school district staff who've been able to attend this summit. It's usually, I think around a thousand bucks to attend and they have it free as free registration for food service operators. I've heard they've done an amazing job, really offers that color, culinary lens to how plant forward plant-based meal school meals can be delicious and students will love it. Um, and also I'm sure most people are already aware but the CDFA has their farm to school grant program that was released and that deadline is coming up on February 16th. Um, Friends of the Earth is offering um, some capacity to support with those grant applications for K through 12 public schools. So if anyone on the call today is interested in that, um, please uh, reach out to us and we can, we can follow up. All right, on to the next slide. So uh, a note here for our next webinar, our next and last webinar of our four part series. This is gonna be on February 10th. 
Um, today's webinar was our longest one at 90 minutes. So this webinar will be an hour and we're going to be exploring some new research um, that we're really excited about releasing. It, it looks at the data and at all these meals that are being served across California and we document the state of school lunch. Um, and the research really showcases what the most consistently offered school lunches are. And this was from the 2019 year. And it also looks at USDA foods data and the purchasing dollars and the environmental impact of our USDA foods program. So it really digs into a lot of the policy behind our school meals, how that is um, coming up in California school lunches. And we're going to be exploring um, some opportunities for what we can do to start um, supporting school districts more in adopting climate friendly meal practices, looking at where we are now, and where we can go from there. Um, so we're really excited for that. We're going to have a panel of school districts on their recommendations for school food policy. So you'll hear from more of your peers on, on their position with all of this and how we can all work together. Um, and we're going to be looking at how we can best support your policy needs as Friends of the Earth um, supporting school districts in this journey towards climate friendly cuisine. So we hope to see you there. Um, we also have our registration site. We have a LinkedIn event page to promote this webinar. So please share it with your colleagues um, and invite your other school district, um, people in your school district network to attend this webinar. Um, here's our slide for the USDA professional standards of the different areas that we covered today um, for your reference. And um, that will be available in the recording and in the slides that get shared as a follow-up email if you need to make a note of that. And then on to the next slide. Um, so some of you on the webinar may not be aware, um, maybe you've seen my announcement, but in case you haven't, I do want to uh, use this opportunity um, as, um, yeah, just announcing that I will be transitioning away from Friends of the Earth um, after nearly two years. It's bittersweet to announce that this will be my last days today and um, the last webinar. As senior school food specialist, we're still having our webinar on February 10th, but I won't be attending that. Um, and I'm moving into a new role with Community Alliance of Family Farmers, actually, as the Farm to Market Tech Hub Specialist um, starting in February. Um, so I'm on to my new adventure, um, living by my train tracks as my train conductor, but I'll be really close by at CAF. Um, so I know I'll be seeing a lot of you around still, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to continuing to support the Good Food Movement across California. Um, I'd like to just thank you all for your dedication to improving the health of our food system our communities and the planet. Um, the amount of inspiration, compassion, and leadership demonstrated by all of you will be carried with me throughout my career, and it's going to carry forward in the Friends of the Earth program as well. Um, and I'm honored to have the opportunity to serve along all of you on working on these complex challenges. And I really look forward to seeing the next round of achievements and what you are all able to achieve together here um, through collaboration and through working with um, all nonprofits like Friends of the Earth. So I'll miss working with you all. Um, I wish you all the best and yeah, just thank you so much for attending. Um, thank you for everything that you're doing and we are ending right on time for today. Um, so I can't thank you enough. Thank you to all the speakers for um, providing us your insight and knowledge during today's session. And we hope to see you on February 10th at 2.30. Um, so thank you everyone. This concludes today's webinar, but I will stay on for a minute to look at the text in the chat box. But thank you, everyone.